I, I've never met you before. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, <laughs> will it be the first thing that, that the audience hears on Facebook? Maybe great. it'll be like a soft opening. Yeah. Yes, great. Let's start with introductions. Yes. Uh, my name is Irina Wilder. I'm an improviser, director, actor, writer, a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm currently based in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, I have worked with many theaters over the years, but after the move, I'll have to settle down and figure out uh, lots of things. I teach a, a lot online and, and at the festivals, and I'm very happy to be here. How did you discover improv? How were you first introduced? <laughs> um, that's a great question. The thing is, I've trained as, as an actor in the Stanislavski system, which means improvisation has always been part of what I did in theater in general. But I did not discover improv as its own thing, as an art form, until I moved to Gothenburg um, about five years ago. No, six. Um, and then, yeah, oh, look! <laughs> It, it actually works. We can get up on stage and we don't have a script and it all works. And my <laughs> theater directors go, nope, that is not how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Stephen, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself as well? Um, hi, I'm Stephen. Uh, I run Impromiscuous, which is a, an improv school slash etc. Um, I've been teaching for a long time all around the world. Uh, I've written a couple of books about improv sort of around inclusion. One's called Play Like an Ally and the other is called Improvising Gender. Um, so I work a lot in sort of inclusion in improv. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> so what drew you to improv? What like really made you go, oh, I really like this activity? Um, so in a previous life, I was a classically trained clarinet player. And I wrote my master's thesis on how people learn to improvise music. So specifically like free jazz and like improv that doesn't have quote unquote rules. Um, and because there wasn't much writing about it, I ended up reading a bunch of pedagogy about dance and theater improv as well. And I read about theater improv and I thought, oh, that would be good for me. <laughs> um, and I was terrible for a good couple of years. And now I love it. And here I am. <laughs> I did not know that. That's really interesting. That is so interesting. Uh, welcome everybody who's been watching. That was just a soft opening. This is going to be our interview about safe play improv, something that I I think it's very interesting. I love the idea and I want to hear more. Um, and I'm just going to ask both of you um, the question, whoever wants to respond, or I don't know how you want to kind of um, uh, maybe like table tennis it across. But the first question I have is, is how did this idea come about? Like, where did you originate this idea? What inspired you? How did you come up with safe play improv? Um, well, so Safe Play was initially uh, initiated by Gael Dornweird Perry. Um, he got some people together to talk about the issue, and it sort of it grew in a really organic way. Um, we've been around for a couple of years, but we've only recently gone public because there's just so much sticky stuff around the topic. Um, so it was a small group of us initially looking into legality of what we could do uh, in the context of every different European country has its own laws about libel and etc. Um, and sort of figuring out specifically what our mission was, what we could do. And then we brought on a second round of people once we felt like our house was in order um, to kind of expand the, the skill sets we have and also the identities represented within the group. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's um, right. Go ahead, Irene, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think the, the biggest uh, answer or the, the biggest question is how did it all start? Well, it started with the need because all of us um, in one form or another have encountered situations where people were harassed or bullied. And like from sharing those <laughs> stories, we realized, first of all, that this situation is not limited to one theater or one city or one country it's it's very widespread and secondly we also realized that the power um, of doing something about it is in coming together 
And while we are not the first group who, who is trying to do something about it in 2017, 2018, uh, when the Me Too movement started, there were a few groups who attempted to build something on the ground in the US. There is Fair Play in Minnesota. There was a group called Women and Comedy. But for us, we are a group of European improvisers. And what we bring is, like Stephen said, a, a difference of backgrounds and a, a very diverse um, views and experiences. But also we come from very different countries, which means we bring a lot of knowledge of the local improv scenes. And um, we can also influence a lot of uh, things by bringing our experience. Yeah, um, I think that uh, we're going to talk about what is safe play improv, but I think that one of the reasons I'm so interested is one of the things you're tackling or one of the things you're trying to, to improve is something we've been needing to have for a long time now, something that we need to find some sort of mechanism. Um, so, Stephen, I'll ask you this question, and then, Irene, again, you can hop in if you'd like to. What is safe play improv? Like, what, what is the mechanism, or how do people interface with it? What is safe play improv? Um, Safe Play Improv is a group of improvisers from all over Europe. Uh, we're working to combat sexual harassment in improv. Uh, specifically, we are providing resources around um, harassment within different countries uh, in Europe. We're looking at putting on some workshops about creating healthy improv cultures. Um, and we have a, a sort of disclosure bit of our website where people can uh, write in with experiences that they've had. Um, with that information, we keep a little database about who has been complained about. Obviously, for libel reasons, we're not going to publish it or anything. Um, although sometimes I really wish we could, but we can't. We can't. Um, but we're working with um, festivals and schools and etc. to have a sort of check system, if that makes sense. So folks can write to us and say, have there been any complaints about this guy? And we can't necessarily get into details, but if we say yes, seven, that's that should be enough information. <laughs> um, because yeah, there are, there are teachers touring around in Europe who are well known to be problematic and like chronically problematic. Um, yeah. Europeans and Americans who are touring around and like it's a sort of it's a it's a very open secret sometimes but because of the way these information systems work and because of how big the European scene is there's every chance you could hire someone problematic without any idea even if lots of other people know that about them because they're just friends with the right people which doesn't quite seem right. And also there are a few people, sorry, I'm going on, but I have strong feelings. Uh, there are definitely people who are in the camp of, well, he's always been nice to me, or he's a great teacher, I'll hire him anyway. Um, and we would just love to have a tiny bit more structure and accountability around that. I, I love that you want to talk a lot about it because like I said, I think this is something that we've been needing in the community for a long time. Irina, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, like Stephen said, a lot of what what we're doing is collecting information, and we hope to, um, yeah, to to prevent um, abusive or or harassing teachers from from keeping doing that. Right. So if we can kind of put some limits, that would be good by working with festivals and by by working with um, theaters. But the other reason why we're collecting information is um, to, to just gather statistics and to put things in perspective, to give context to what's going on. Because in addition to um, the, the serial killer fallacy, which is he's always been nice to me, my neighbor has never done anything to me, right? Therefore, he cannot be a serial killer. Like that's not how, how that works. The other fallacy is it, it cannot happen in my theater or it cannot happen in my city. It's happening somewhere there. It's happening in Chicago or London. It's not happening to me or my group. 
Um, by gathering experiences, I can safely say that is happening in all countries, in all um, theaters, in all festivals. So you don't have an excuse of not doing anything about it or not being interested in it because supposedly people in your community are not affected by it. So by collecting that um, statistics, by collecting real stories, and it's not just our database, we also have a list of resources with like three pages of articles that have been published in um, in um, newspapers from all over the world where people have gone public with their stories and sometimes named names. So you can see how widespread that uh, problem is. I think for me, it's very important that we keep in mind um, that it's not just an individual problem. It's not just one bad guy who has spoiled everything from for, for everybody. It's, it is that, it is individual, because the majority of improvisers are wonderful, kind, and very, very trustworthy people. But it's also a structural problem. It's a structural problem at the level, or cultural problem at the level of society, where we don't talk about harassment, or we don't uh, appreciate how widespread the problem is. Um, but it's also the institutional problem where in improv, the friendly networks and the culture of yes ending maybe sometimes protects the wrong people and silences the people who are abused. And we want to combat that as well. So it's personal, but also cultural and institutional. That, that is fantastic insight. I'm so happy you said so many of those things. In, in my experience, when there's someone who's been victimized or on the, on, the, on the very bad end of sexual harassment, many times they leave the whole community. Like we lose that voice to contribute to improv. So that's one of the reasons why that, that um, the, the suspect or the person that's abuser stays because they stay in improv and their victims leave. Um, so thank you so much for all that insight. I used to work with, um, with hate, hate crime programs in the city of West Hollywood. And we used to have to get training and not calling them hate crimes when you're talking to someone because there's certain language that when people hear that word, they immediately go, no, that's not me. They immediately they hear the word hate, they go, oh, that's not me, that's someone else over there in the distance. But it can be them and it can be someone close to them and their family. So you brought some great insight about how like sex harassment, we always think like that happens over there in that community over there, but it can happen very locally, That that's fantastic. Uh, Steven, did you wanna uh, expand on that or we can move on to the next question? Um, yeah, so I think something that Irina said just kind of made me think about uh, culture and how we decide what is and isn't okay in improv. And I think one of the things that Safe Play is really trying to encourage is just talking about things. Because so often we assume what appropriate boundaries and behaviors are based on our own experience of the world. Um, whereas actually what people are comfortable with and what is okay, particularly once you start touring around different countries, it varies wildly. Um, as an example, I, <laughs> so most of the time now with groups, people are getting better and better about doing a little boundaries check-in. Uh, and I used to say during my boundaries check-in, touch me anywhere. And I meant it. Um, but then someone put their tongue up my nostril and I thought, oh, no, I didn't mean it. I just hadn't, I didn't have the context. I do have boundaries. I just didn't realize. Um, but that's because like none of my personal boundaries had been crossed, right? But for the person who put their tongue up my nose, that was fine behavior. Um, and on the other side of that spectrum, there's lots of folks who just culturally or for personal reasons, straight up don't want to be touched. And somehow that's being on a different spot in that spectrum from someone else creates so much difficulty around communication because I think we just don't quite get what boundaries are and that everyone has them and that they're different for different reasons in different contexts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely, and they can change over time. Like your boundary yeah. this year, it might be different the next year. And because you've learned new insight or learned something else, I totally agree with that. Um, Irina, I'm gonna ask you the next question. And this um, question comes up from our discussion. Oh, did you have something you wanna say? I'm sorry. 
Um, I, I'm afraid to go on a on a wide tangent, but I think since we started talking about culture and and boundaries, I think one thing that is important to always keep in mind when we're talking about the culture of improv is that a lot of what has been normalized in improv, particularly in uh, the Western countries, comes from theater, from the acting practices that have been established by the founders of, of improv who have most of them have been trained actors uh, and theater in general the, the the classic theater is grappling with the same uh, problems they they are struggling with the system of uh, perpetuated harassment and sexual uh, harassment so just keeping in mind that um the actors who who have been trained in the past to have no boundaries to be ready to do whatever the director is asked and you are supposed to be a good actor so you always say yes to whatever uncomfortable or crazy or just uh, um, plainly uh, inappropriate thing is asked of you you say yes because what if they won't call you again <laughs> right um right now theater and and um cinema there like the, the industries are grappling with the, trying to combat the same problems but in improv we are kind of late to the party because that culture of um harassment has permeated everything so firmly and has been yeah just normalized so firmly that um, a lot of people are, why do we need a boundary check? Like we are not going to do anything crazy. We are, all, all of that is unnecessary, right? Um, all of that is unnecessary and, and uh, it's a censorship and so on. Uh, we need to remember that yes, theater practices have been unsafe historically, very unsafe and um in many cases it was just plain institutionalized harassment if you think meisner and i'm going on a tangent but it, bear with me it's important uh, meisner is not only a classic the most classic example of of a guru and an acting teacher who has been venerated for being the greatest of them all he's also a, a a sex observed, uh, obsessed narcissist. In his own book, he comes across as a, as a crazy sex maniac. He makes lewd comments. He touches his female students under the clothes. Like, and, and that is the theater practice that um, kind of came to improv because we have been a part of theater. But then in improv, because we're yes ending, because we don't have a script that could provide a little bit of um, distance or like safety limit to what the actors are expected to do, because we don't have um, any institutional checks on what the actors will do once they go on stage or what the directors will do, what the teachers will do. Our situation is actually a lot more dangerous than in classic theaters. So for us, uh, combating that problem should be also more, more urgent and more important than in classic theater. I want you to always go off on tangents. That was brilliant and super insightful. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna ask you the next question. Mm -hmm. um, for now, is Safe Play looking at sexual harassment? Um, like if people wanna access the website and they have issues of racism or maybe discrimination in a totally different way, for now, is Safe Play just focusing on sexual harassment or is it all forms of discrimination or how would you like to address that? I don't think we are aiming for discrimination um, necessarily, but harassment in general or bullying in general, yes because for for three reasons one uh, in many cases it's very difficult to separate what is um sexual harassment versus harassment in general the same person could um, make sexist or misogynist comments 
and be very transphobic or racist. And that behavior just like you don't separate it in, into tiny boxes if it all comes um, comes up, right? And and it it also very often comes for for similar reasons. Secondly, um, we encourage all people, and I'm talking about festival organizers, theater owners, directors, to ask themselves whether they know the definition of harassment bullying, oh, so good. sexual harassment, good. Um, microaggression in their own countries. Do you know what how the law defines harassment in your own country? And if you do, then maybe you will have a lot more insight into how to prevent it and what to do when a situation like this occurs. Many people think that they know what sexual harassment is or what harassment is, and they don't because the, the information is not everywhere, right? You have to um, seek it out. You have to um, educate yourself. And it's just not something that people normally would do. And it's, again, it's part of what Safe Play intends to do, providing that education, providing that context that information base we have a list of resources but also like just encouraging people to think about what it means to why do you instill boundaries what is harassment how do you identify like can you spot harassing behavior and can you spot an abusive teacher how do you define when, when it is and is, is, is not harassment? And it's not always easy. But at the same time, like I see so many articles and blog posts published on um, how to play a specific game or how to find the game of the scene or um, like theory of, of improv. And it's all fantastic and it's all very interesting and, and important. But maybe... I would love to see a discussion of, hey, this is how harassment looks in improv communities, because guess what? This is what, and if I may share a, a personal example that, that I remember, there was a, um, a dinner at a festival, and we just happened to be um, a group of women sitting at, at one table while, um, like, a group of other improvisers of mixed genders sat at another table. There were four of us, and it turned out, like, during our dinner conversation, that all of us had experience of sexual harassment and assault. Um, and it's not something that we wanted to discuss. I could hear the glimpses of our conversations at other tables. People were discussing the theory of improv and talking about beer and travel and other wonderful things. I want to talk about that as well. I want to have a good time. I don't want to talk about sexual harassment, but I have to because it affects me. It affects my friends. It affects people in my communities. So I would just encourage more people to think and talk about it so that at some point we can stop talking about it because the problem will, will be less urgent and less, less dramatic. Thank you so much for that. Stephen, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I guess just going back to your original question, uh, our form is completely open so people can submit any kind of complaint. So if you have an issue that uh, is, for example, bullying or racism or transphobia or homophobia, go ahead and submit it. Um, because we're more focused on sexual harassment, the resources you get back from us will be more focused around that, but we will keep a record of everything. And it still kind of goes into that We've had seven complaints about this guy. Um, I say guy, it's not all men. Um, but for the for the sake of efficiency, it's like 75% men. Um, yeah. I'm and I think that, but yeah. <laughs> yes, agree, agree. Uh, um, I think also 
to what Irina said, we can't we can't be talking about gender equality without also being talking about anti-racism and homophobia and ableism because it's it's all the same thing in in its essence and at its depth it's inclusion and um intersectionality just comes into that at every single point so yeah although it's not our official remit yes of course and i think something that i notice again and again is I talk a lot about improv theaters who have this structure where uh, a small group of friends had an improv group and it went really well. And then they started teaching classes and then they got a physical space and they have a stage and they put things on and it just kind of grows from that initial group of friends. Um, and there's a lot of structural issues that go on with that. One of which is at what point in that journey did you write an anti-harassment policy? <laughs> Or did you just forget because you were all friends and everyone was having a nice time? Um, and I feel like I, I say things like that all the time um, or I call out specific types of theater directors and everyone thinks I'm talking about their theater, but it's all theaters, I promise. <laughs> that's yes. how most of them came to exist. And that's why most of them have really similar egos and social structures and issues. <laughs> Absolutely. I totally relate to that. I totally agree with that. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to ask you a question and Irina, you can, you can, um, you can give some follow-up as well is um, what has been the biggest challenge so far in creating this group? Um, well, so the reason we've taken genuinely a couple of years to go fully public with it is just the, the time it's taken to, get all of our knowledge collected between all of us and figure out the legality and definitions. And we've taken some training as well about um, just uh, trauma informed practice. Um, and I think just feeling like we were equipped and knew what we could and couldn't do took a long time. Um, just because, gosh, it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, um, I think there are several challenges. Um, so just to expand on what Stephen is doing. One is, um, I, I think it, it bears, um, it, it, it is important to mention that when we say we want to do something, um, a lot of people reach out to us saying, hey, you should cancel this person or... Uh, fire that guy we cannot fire that guy um, especially if it's an independent teacher especially if it's a um, festival that we have absolutely no um, connection or authority we don't have a connection or authority over any group or theater or festival what we can do is to provide information trainings context so that people can um, make their own decisions. What we are trying to do is to create a better culture, right? It's a systemic change. And as any systemic change, it's very challenging. It's very difficult because there is just so much, so much to do. Um, so first of all, yes, defining our own mandate in a way, defining the knowledge that we needed to do what we wanted to do, and how, how can we make sure that our initiative will achieve realistic results and will not be just, you know, uh, kitchen table discussions. Um, but secondly, just reaching out and making sure that people start talking about it across Europe across all European communities or across the world, if if need be, because again, the improv community is very international. It's not like we can limit ourselves in, in some borders. But just um, talking to people who, uh, um, I don't want to say refuse to listen, but are maybe mm, don't have the knowledge to uh, engage with it immediately, right? So you, the first uh, second we we went public, you reached out to us, right? Um, 
for other teachers, it's maybe like Stephen said, why do we need an anti-harassment policy? What's what's the point? Or if they write a policy, it's just a piece of paper that has absolutely no use because nobody will ever look at it or is expected to make use of it. So my question then is to everybody who has any sort of authority, who has organized workshops, who has taught classes or directed shows or organized a festival. If you have a policy, that's great. How are you going to enforce that policy? What do you do if something happens? How is, is that just a piece of paper or are you going to be able to do something? But then even more importantly, how can we change the culture so that we prevent things from happening, right? As any doctor will, will tell you, prevention and prophylactics are better than surgery. So how can we create an environment where we normalize safety, where we normalize respect and trust rather than abuse? We don't need toxic or abusive teachers. It's a bonus. It's a personality bonus. We don't need to hire uh, teachers who are abusive just because they are there. <laughs> there are plenty of teachers who are not. Um, so how do we normalize respect and trust? How do we nor normalize non-harassment, non-discrimination? Um, and then, yeah, if we are talking about trust, um, the reason why we need safe play and why we cannot just rely on policies at individual theaters, like don't don't mess with my theater. I will deal with that. Um, here is where where it gets tricky, um, and and it comes again and it comes up again and again in many reports and many stories that people tell us. A lot of the times, uh, people don't trust their theater leaders. They trust them as directors for sure, or improvisers for sure. We all are great talented artists we are making art or comedy or whatever it is you're doing in your community but if i don't trust you to know the definition of harassment or microaggression or bullying i'm not sure how you're going to react if i report that so i'm not going to i'm going to stay silent because speaking up might be dangerous for me, because speaking up might make me the troublemaker, which means I'm not going to say anything, even if the theater supposedly have an, an anti-harassment policy or a code of conduct. And then that system of silence is perpetuated, right? It, then it becomes not only me, then it become, becomes more and more people, right? Because that is what silence and the lack of trust create um and for me that is heartbreaking if i'm a festival organizer or a theater director the notion that people don't trust me to report something i would think very carefully whether or not i deserve to be a theater owner or a, a director if they don't trust me to implement the anti-harassment policy that I supposedly have, then probably I'm doing something wrong for my community. But that's that's the vast majority of theaters because of this, we started as a gang of friends thing, right? Yeah. Uh, it's great to have a non-retaliation policy in your reporting system, but do you have the emotional maturity and boundaries to not hold a grudge if your friend is accused of something maybe maybe not it's a very good point and i love your point about how like a lot of like theaters and institutions and, and groups have just started because it's a group of friends that got together and want to keep on doing it but then they have to kind of look at themselves and like okay are we taking money for a service are we taking money for classes or shows or or whatever it is and now we're accountable to a greater good because we're providing a service i completely agree with all that um so Irene, i'm going to ask you a question and Stephen davidson you can follow up on this the question i have is 
um, if people want to support Safe Play Improv, like, do you have like a, a, a page to, for donations or for funds? Or if people want to support, is it better just to get the word out? If, if people want to support this, what, how do you recommend it? Um, getting the word out and starting the discussions in their own communities is the major form, form of support, right? Because it's not about us. It's not about Steven or me or uh, any member of, of Safe Play. Uh, it's about changing the culture in, in improv so that maybe Safe Play will become obsolete in a few years, hopefully. <sighs> I'm pessimistic that it would happen, but a girl can dream. Um, here's the thing donations and and um, um like things like that we would rather uh, want to to be invited to teach workshops right we want to give you information we want to give people the tools and the context the knowledge that they need to institute change in their own communities because it's in many cases, very specific to a country or to um, local cultural context, we cannot just accept donations and say, hey, we are going to come in and fix everything for you. No, it's your job to, to make sure that your community is safe. But we can help with providing uh, education and training and, and information. And for that, yes, we hope to, to, to be paid so that we can keep our operations going. But also spreading the discussion, right? Keep going, the, 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 like discussing these questions more and more openly without fear, without making this discussion something, um, I don't know, that only happens once in a blue moon or that only happens uh, in specific bad theater is to bad people no it happens everywhere and just like improv is is a, a part of a, of a bigger society yes sexual harassment is part of a larger society and we cannot escape that in improv simply because we have friends here um so yeah if we can get more people on our side and kind of get along, um, we have a partnership program. So uh, theaters and festivals and um, schools who have gone through our uh, trainings, who have engaged with us, who have developed their not only anti-harassment policies and codes of conduct, but also the procedures that will help them to um, enforce those policies to to create safer um, uh, environments and safer spaces in, in their communities. Um, we call them partners, and they uh, yeah they get the perk of of being associated with safe play. It's not an endorsement, but we or rather it is an endorsement for us. It's very important because it's our reputations on the line, right? So we only would endorse theaters who are actually serious about this. Um, yeah. Steven, would you like to add something? Um, yeah. I just, on top of the endorsement idea, I guess I wanted to talk very briefly about um, just the phrase safe space and how I think particularly in improv because it's improvised we can't guarantee that nobody's ever going to be triggered or have a boundary crossed no matter how nice we are and how much we're trying but if we have a space that is held what we can say is that there's someone in charge who is willing and able to engage with a discussion around that and handle it like an adult um and i feel like when we're talking about theaters we're talking about similar things it, it's not our stamp saying nothing bad will ever happen to you here. It's more a competent adult will talk to you about it and make <laughs> make efforts to fix the problem if something does happen, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a mark of uh, knowledge and willingness to discuss, which goes a long way.
I, I totally agree. And my hope is that like in the future that maybe like a festival can have like maybe the, the logo in the corner of Safe Play Improv to say that the, all the instructors and the leisure have been trained in, in the training that you all provide, which is, I think would be a fantastic sort of like credibility and, and add integrity to every festival that has that stamp. Um, I, Irina, I'm gonna, and I'm going to go to you too as well, Stephen, but like do you have anything else that maybe we didn't touch on this interview that you'd like to say about Safe Play Improv? Mm -hmm. I want to go in another tangent. Okay, uh, good. Yes, good. Because um, I think we we touched a lot um, upon boundaries and like things that are important for for, um, for for the procedure, right? For for the um, making harassment less of a frequent occurrence, but. Um, I think when I talked about theater culture, I did not make specific how uh, improv makes it a little bit more dangerous, not only because it's all improvised without a script, but also because of the principle of yes ending that has been like um, indoctrinated uh, and is still being in, in, indoctrinated by so many um, schools and so many teachers. Um, it's a great principle that helps us and supports us um, in building realities, collaborate together, if we have trust and respect on stage. But it can also become very coercive. And I think, David, you had um, a recent story um, on, on the Improv Boost page when that is exactly what happened. Um, the principle of yes ending um, treats people a little bit like you cannot say no, right? You cannot, we don't trust you to be an intelligent adult who is able to make decisions for yourself. We have to, we, we need you to say yes in all situations. That is not trust and not respect. That is coercion. That is dictatorship. If you've ever seen news stories about uh, authoritarian elections when saying yes is the only choice, that is exactly what coercion is. And I would like to question why we have that principle in improv. What is the necessity of yes if it's coercive? If we don't have the culture of trust and respect as the foundation, as the normal state of affairs, and instead we just expect people to say yes, no matter how misguided, offensive, or sexist, or, or racist, or ableist, or whichever um, idiotic idea um, they, they bring on stage or off stage, then that is not exactly supportive, is it? I'm not going to trust people um, when they say, I've got your back, or we'll support each other. We all are doing this great supportive collaborative art form. No, that's hypocrisy. If ESN becomes coercive, if ESN helps to promote the culture of harassment and bullying, because one person does a lot of stupid bullshit and expects everyone to yes and them and stay silent if they want to contradict them. Because if you're not having fun, then you are the asshole. If you want to speak up, then you are the troublemaker. Then it is a lot more dangerous than um, just the discussion of harassment as it's happening in theaters or um, in the movies. And I think that for me is like the burning need that we need to solve. And that is the reason why we're here. Yeah, further to that, I feel like, yeah. um, so for me as someone who loves to be touchy and edgy and political on stage, for me, the most important point of trust that I can have with another performer is knowing that they will absolutely say no to me if they're not comfortable. Um, and if I don't have that, 
I will be sending the scene two meters away from you, making polite chit chat. <laughs> Cause it's just, I, it's, you can't trust someone's yes if they wouldn't say no to you. And that's just such a tenuous ground to do anything um, deep or meaningful from. That's all. The, the yes and thing isn't just about, um, it's not just about preventing harassment. It's about allowing the things that we will genuinely want to say yes to to happen safely. That's all. So I recently interviewed Joe Thompson, who in turn was quoting his experience with you, Stephen, that you, he would take a class with you. And he was talking about that yes and is not just about teaching people like as an individual, that's something they do, but it's something they expect from the space. And it has to be taught differently because people that are immigrants to a culture, um, they have to do that every single second of their life to survive. And so people from the dominant narrative just kind of blankly don't even think about it and don't do it. So that concept of accepting or an improv, I'm sure it's more like building a scene together, um, has to be taught differently to different people. So I think, and that's something that Joe Thompson kind of quoted you on, Stephen Davidson, because you're, you're, you're so insightful about this sort of thing. Um, do you have anything else? Or do you have anything else you'd like to, I love your tangents, if you have another tangent you want to go on. <laughs> we can keep this discussion going. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is, is there anything else you'd like to close with? Um, um, I just I want to flag that there will be more, hopefully soon, there will be more uh, publications and panels that Safe Play is going to organize. So we have Facebook and, and Instagram. Please um, engage with us. Please follow, follow up. And please share your stories. Because every story, and I'm sure that every improviser who has been doing it for more than two weeks have stories and usually not one. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, please tell us your stories. Because collecting that experience, that lived experience from every single theater from every single country from every single context is important not only for us to understand what's going on but also to demonstrate to um, festival organizers or theater owners or directors how different um, situations could play out what worst situations or what, what what are the worst consequences that, that could happen when you don't prevent one toxic individual from um, from abusing your whole community in many ways and in many ways for many many years and also uh, yeah just in keeping open that discussion on the the cultural differences when people need to be mindful of not only their own boundaries but also the boundaries of their partners and not assume that whatever is okay for me would also be okay for you because that's not how that works um yeah all those stories inform what we can do and that is what hopefully will bring this substantial change to the improv communities that we care about yeah and further Thank to that so much Seth, Stephen, go. i please also share stories that felt like a minor inconvenience um it doesn't have to be a serious or legal level issue like because a dozen minor inconvenience stories about the same guy is also a pretty big red flag and we'd love to know about that <laughs> That is a fantastic point. I think sometimes people that have experienced it don't want to bother someone else or they don't want to, you know, they think that maybe that maybe this wasn't illegal. So maybe it's not worth mentioning. And I think that's a fantastic point. Thank you both for being part of this. Um, and thank you everyone for watching. I'll leave this up on the improv booth. So you feel free to share this, but please follow Safe Play Improv. They're doing something fantastic. Also, um, they made some really good points about um, Fair Play Minnesota. We give a shout out to them and Gail Dorn Dornward Perry. Like that, that's some fantastic stuff. And thank you both for all your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.